We'll kick those tires and start that, well, somewhat real fire. Today we are camping in a very special place, and my next guest actually does need an introduction, because long ago he shed mere mortal status before he attained self-proclaimed deity status. Who am I speaking of? Well, I'm speaking of the tyrannical head of the despotic theocracy known only as the Daily Wire to the common citizenry. Now, their vast media empire expands upon podcasting, journalism, TV, and film, and of course now, little blades of glory known only as Jeremy's Razors. So please, put your hands and offering bins together as we welcome to his own set, his royal grace and lowercase god king of the Daily Wire, Mr. Jeremy Boring. You're welcome. Oh, thanks. That's a wrap. I appreciate you doing that. That was awesome. So I will say, self-proclaimed. Uh, that may be to, inaccurate. I have to push back. I was proclaimed God King by one Andrew Clavin at the beginning of the Daily Wire. Uh, and I've given a lot of thought as to why he chose to refer to me as the God King. For one thing, I was in charge. And I think it was his way of saying to all the young staffers, like, I know you're millennials, and I don't, know you don't think that there's any sort of thing, any such thing as hierarchy, but you do have a boss. It's the Daily Wire God King, uh, Jeremy. I think in part it was to make sure that I never uh, got any delusional notion that I was the uppercase guy uh, as I was running the company and everybody had to do whatever I wanted. So in some ways, as with every interaction with Andrew Clavin, you never know if it's a compliment uh, housed in a rebuke or a rebuke housed in a compliment. But somewhere in there, it was he who... Uh, I see. And that's why he's been relegated to a whole other area, and I don't actually see him anymore. Yes. Um, he, it was also interesting because I think he just published a book on the Gospels in particular. So it's interesting that a man who prides himself on real theological uh, you know, analysis and discourse actually gave someone else a deity status. So, <laughs> so that's the origin. I was actually going to be my first question. You beat me to it, which should I be surprised at an omniscient God King doing that? I'm cur I was curious where the origins, because I actually knew you back, I think, when you were just called Jeremy yeah. at the time. Yeah, um, the, the, the humble, from humble beginnings. Yeah, you actually, so this is interesting. I've, I've known you over a decade, um, and you were heading up, uh, or not heading up, but you were, run, you were with an organization uh, called Friends of Abe. Hmm. And this is a long time ago. And I just learned this as I was researching through the lore about you, is that uh, the IRS was actually trying to get names uh, yeah. from that, and you said no. And I sourced all this from an extremely accurate, so it's called Wikipedia, I think it's called. So they had <laughs> yeah. a, just at the bottom right there is that you said no. So what was going on there? Yeah, so we had this, uh, the, the, the worst kept secret in Hollywood was Friends of Abe. It was an organization <laughs> of conservatives working in the industry uh, who would come together for fellowship. Mostly it was uh, you know, a lot of people who, especially during the, the Bush years, thought they were the only people in the industry who thought the way that they thought. And we would host them at these 40-person lunches, and they would realize, oh, there's other people in my space who actually believe the things that I believe. It was not uncommon uh, to see like grown men weep at these lunches. You know, not uncommon to hear people say, you know, I, if my agent knew I was here, I, I heard someone say, if my wife knew that I was here, oh, wow. I could lose my marriage. People were so deeply closeted in that community with their beliefs. And so in particular, at the, the late Bush years and all throughout the Obama uh, years. Friends of Abe was a really thriving community uh, there in LA and at one point I was asked to to lead it for a little over five years. At one point the IRS came and said we need to know because of your taxes, it was a 501c3, because of your tax exempt status we need to know the names of every member of the organization. And this was during that period when the Obama IRS was really cracking down on any Nonprofits that like had the word liberty or patriot or anything of they that. They wanted book lists, I remember. Mm -hmm. Reading they materials. That's right. Ha, huh, I don't read. Joke's on them. <laughs> yeah, so they, were, they, they called up. They said they wanted the list, and we said, no, that's just, that's not going to happen. I actually had no idea if it was even legal to tell them no. Uh, I, I sort of reacted in this uh, characteristically pugilistic way that I do, uh, and then I had to quickly go find legal help, and you know, the organization <laughs> didn't have very much money. Uh, what ultimately happened is uh, uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, who just passed away this week, uh, intervened on our behalf. I'd never met the senator, uh, oh, wow. but, he, but he caught wind of what was happening, and he intervened on our behalf and basically barked the IRS off of us. But it was, uh, it was several weeks of really high-stakes poker with the federal government. How stressful was that? You know, if I'd, if I'd been smart enough to be stressed, I would have been. Oh. I've, I've found that my entire life has been like a series of somewhat remarkable uh, experiences that probably are beyond what one man should uh, should get to live through and i've had this you know not not to say the stress of it all never 
never affects me, but in some of these incredibly high stakes moments, I have a kind of oblivion that really, really protects my psyche as I go through. I was on a, uh, I was on a bus heading to Mount Vernon, just outside of DC, when all of this was going on, and it felt like this completely surreal experience that I was going to the home of the founder of the nation, the father of the nation, and his, whatever, 40, 44th, 43rd predecessor was uh, trying to extra legally encroach on my, on my freedoms at the exact same moment. And wow. that's when I got the call that uh, Senator Hatch had taken an interest in what was happening to us. The, the good news is he only knew about it because the New York Times decided to run a front page story about us. And they only decided to run the front page story about us to sort of out the secret organization. But their ostensible justification was the IRS demanding our names. And so wow. their hit piece actually redounded to my benefit. That's, uh, I think, I, so beneath, this is, and you, this all happened prior to you uh, acquiring any sort of flamethrower or any sort of self-defense <laughs> uh, materials. I do yeah. want to get into the carbon emissions of the flamethrower and whether you have offset those. Uh, since running that commercial, <laughs> but we'll get to that. I'm, I'm curious, yeah. so one thing that, you know, just right off the bat, like, so underneath all the, the pomp and circumstance and the jokes and owning the libs and leftist tears, et cetera, I yep. think there are, there's a, a vast swath of the country that just, they, they may not just understand or care necessarily, but like what's going on as far as, is there an actual bias? I know both sides feel that there's a bias on either side, but is there, I would actually have to ask you, just being since you've been openly, you know, conservative, you know, and and, and mm -hmm. spearhead a, a, a organization that is so conservative, yeah. You know, what are the actual consequences of that? And you, this goes back to Hollywood too, because I think some people may not understand there are real consequences yep. for being. We're seeing that more and more now. I think with cancel culture, but even prior to that, you mentioned people crying at these events, et cetera. But like, what were the stakes? And and I'm curious, like, what are some of the stakes and the oh, consequences, yeah. and even the security you've needed? I had to go through a series of ritualistic baptisms to even get into here. <laughs> um, but this is this all the it's price true. of being a conservative? Yeah, you know. Obviously, we live in a really polarized moment in the country. The, the culture is completely bifurcating along these political lines, and, and our social cohesion is uh, frayed probably in ways that we have not seen in this country in living memory. It's certainly, I mean, we fought a civil war at one point, so I don't want to be too hyperbolic. Right. But never in my lifetime has it, has it been like this. And because of that, I'm sure it's actually true that both sides, uh, people who work very in a front-facing role uh, on both sides, are under a certain amount of pressure. What's unique about conservatives is that since all of the major institutions in the country, from corporations most recently, the media, the entertainment, uh, sports, journalism, most of the levers of government, certainly the federal government, the administrative state, all of them have been infiltrated. All of them uh, are now firmly uh, leftward leaning. And because of that, while it may be true that, you know, a person who's in a position like mine at a media company on the left probably also feels a certain amount of pressure, they get a certain amount of hate in social media, uh, they probably have security at the door, all that, yes. Uh, nevertheless, all of the cultural, cultural institutions are on their side, and all of the cultural institutions are uh, opposed to the side that I find myself on. And what that means is that while there are there are crackpots on the left and crackpots on the right. and Some jerk somewhere may try to harm someone on the left, uh, which of course I abhor, and some crackpot on the left may try to harm one of us on the right, which I think any, any uh, uh, decent person on the left would also abhor. All of the actual institutional pressure is against people. And when you say institutional right. pressure, you're talking about media, you're talking about uh, yes. uh, just en entertainment. Yeah, you've, um, you've seen it play out in this really remarkable way with Taylor Lorenz doxing uh, the account libs of TikTok uh, in the pages of the Washington Post, which they, they now deny happened, even though it happened, and then they deleted the information. And so she, she's able to frame herself as a, as a journalist pursuing the truth in what she does. When we, uh, Tim, Tim Poole from Timcast, had this great idea he mentioned on Twitter, you know, I'd like to take out a billboard in Times Square and just point out to people that Taylor Lorenz did, in fact, dox uh, at libs of TikTok. It's not fair that they get to sort of deny a thing that they did right out in the open, and now, now they pretend it didn't happen. Uh, I was able to kind of come in with an assist there because uh, I had a billboard in Times Square that I'd already 
taking out space on for my Jeremy's razors. Oh, so you have a good billboard guy? I got a good, got okay, a good billboard I'd like guy. to talk to you about that afterwards. And so I was able to very quickly help flip that for Tim and see his vision sort of come to fruition. And Taylor Lorenz melts down, you know, she, I want to know who the agency is that sold this. Immediately she wants to go penalize anyone who actually dared sell services to a conservative. She puts out a tweet saying, you know, what, this of course is idiotic and hilarious, but what you may not uh, see right at first is the dark side, the violent underbelly of, the, of this uh, bad faith political attack on me. I have to have security now. And I thought, well, first of all, it wasn't a bad faith attack. It was a very good faith uh, attack. But her bad faith political attack on libs of TikTok, am I supposed to conclude that she had violent intent with that? Uh, I certainly didn't have violent intent with what I did, but her suggestion yeah. that anyone who engages in a bad faith political attack has violent intent, all of that gets echoed by the institutions of the culture when you're on the left. All of it gets denied by those same institutions if you're coming from a position on the right. This is why in the 2020 election, Twitter could literally ban the New York Post from running the, the now demonstrably true Hunter Biden yeah. laptop story. Uh, you can't in any way suggest that that isn't election interference. Of course, it's definitionally uh, election interference. There's nothing like that on the right because the, the actual institutions aren't in service of uh, yeah. those of us who are on the right. And so I think that's where the difference is. It's not it's not the crackpots. There's crackpots, of course, on both yeah. sides. And the right has made mistakes, too. I mean, it's, you know, making journalistic errors is, you know, that's, that's endemic to both sides, right? So it's... Well, journalistic errors is just the nature of, yeah, of journalism. Reporting. Errors ha errors and failures happen in any kind of human endeavor. That's, I don't think that that's the problem. The problem is that the conspiracy uh, to silence the right, the conspiracy to, um, to punish the right isn't a conspiracy at all. It happens right yeah. out in the open. It doesn't even have to be, uh, you don't need conspirators. You don't need yeah. people working together to effectuate that. They do it automatically because all of the institutions are yeah. on their side. And so that's, that's the kind of, I think, pressure that conservatives operating in the culture feel. Is it, so I mean, so you were, you've been in Hollywood for so long and obviously yep. Hollywood's always been known as uh, just, you know, left leaning or whatever. I've yeah, always, I, and again, I don't know much about this, but I've always assumed that there's actually a lot more either centrists or people who actually might be more uh, amenable to uh, conservative politics that were able to reveal themselves. And that was mm. your experience, that there were more than you would think. Yeah, there were 2,800 people in FOA at the height of the organization. You know, words probably, we, we shouldn't quibble about uh, definitions, but Hollywood conservatives are more classically liberal than, uh, you know, than, than other kinds of conservatives around the country yeah. and that makes sense because they're creatives they're creators yeah. they're people who left their home and their family and they went west and they went to the city to try to make something out of nothing to to try to engage in entertainment and art uh, nevertheless they're deeply patriotic they love their country they want the government to leave them alone they think free speech is sacrosanct and needs to be defended and so yes hollywood is intrinsically liberal because it's a creative endeavor, but it isn't intrinsically leftist. It elects to be leftist. I don't think you can, you mm -hmm. can't say that, no, leftists are who go make art. No, 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 no. Liberals are who go make art. Leftists are who now dominate the yeah. conversation in Hollywood. And that's why people stare at their, stare at their shoes and, and don't want their wives or their agents to find out about their politics out there. It's, a, it's an incredibly oppressive so, I mean, that's a real thing. So, I mean, because I'm, I'm, I'm generally asking, because I'm naive to this, but, like, is it a thing? Because I think some of I will go, all right, how, like, really are you going to get banned for that? But it's like, is it a situation where do you know folks are like, hey, look, I mean, obviously, we've, in recent time, we've seen, yeah. you know, people getting removed. But even back then, was it a thing? Like, if someone found out yes. you attended this event, you would, like, literally the, the studio wouldn't hire, or, like, the hire you? Well, I'll happen? say two things. So, is it, is some of it perceived and maybe not right. actually happening? It doesn't matter. That's the thing about, you know, free speech cooling activities that take place. You know, if it has the effect of preventing people from being able to be open about their politics, then it is having a real mm. uh, effect, even if, even if it may not be as bad as people perceive. They perceive it as being bad because it's real and it yeah. has the same effect either way. Uh, but I've heard legitimate horror stories from people during those years, you know, people who would, uh, people were on a set and the director got angry one day, walked on set and said, uh, you know, find me a Republican, I need to fire someone today. I and mean, that's an actual statement from an actual Hollywood uh, 
uh, a real production, not some fringe indie. There's a, a real Hollywood film. This kind of stuff happens out there all the time. You know, during the the last days of the Bush administration, the kind of anti-military things that would be said to veterans, you know, if a if a young actor was coming right off the war of terror, war on terror, uh, and decided to go out to Hollywood and become an actor, the things that casting directors would say directly to their faces about being baby murderers and all this kind of stuff. Oh my God! Uh, truly aberrant behavior, and it has an incredibly chilling effect uh, on people's freedom of expression. So I think that you know. Is it real? Yes. It's real even if some of, some of what people think about it is, is somewhat overblown. Yeah. But the, the person on an individual set at an individual time may not be actually in jeopardy. Right. But there is a broader jeopardy that, that they're responding to. The, the other thing I would say about it is um, when you create a bubble, as Hollywood has done, a political bubble, it, le it breeds worse behavior. The guy who said, find me a Republican, I need someone to fire. Would he have actually fired a Republican for no other reason than being a Republican? I don't know, I'd like to think that he wouldn't. Yeah. But I think he felt perfectly free to say it yeah. because he's built a caricature in his mind of what a Republican is. He doesn't know that he's surrounded by them all the time. He probably doesn't think that there could possibly be one on his set. And so it, it breeds this opportunity for him to behave so badly when in reality, that's that exact same guy, you know, if the gaffer had said, dude, I'm, I'm a Republican and we've made three movies together, he probably would have said, oh, geez, Johnny, I'm, I'm you sorry, tell, man, I'm just having a bad me. day. Yeah. <laughs> so would, would he have actually fired a Republican on the spot? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Right. It, it reinforces a world where he'll, he'll never know if there is a Republican around him. People will keep staring yeah. at their shoes. Absolutely. So... I guess, and I want to, I actually, I'd love to go into this now because you mentioned like we are at such a divided point in our country and I'm talking, I don't know the solution. But on one hand, I go, it makes yeah. sense to go out and, you know, we'll talk about Jeremy's razors and actually, you know, corporations are made with people who have agendas and I, yeah. I'll, I don't fault this. It's like, this is just part of assembling biased people into institutions mm -hmm. will create, you know, messages and they'll do things with, you know, is the solution, so on one hand, do you, you have to fight back in one sense and mm -hmm. just let dollars vote, say I'm gonna support organizations that have whatever my, my beliefs are. Um, but also, is there another line where, you know, does that, not hamper, but is that, does that stall reconciliation? I, I've never felt uncertain yes. of where to go and what the path forward is for this. Well, yes and no. Does it stall reconciliation? No. Does it further divide? Yes. How can both of those things be true? Yeah because there's no way out but through. Okay. Reconciliation for reconciliation's sake isn't going to happen. Yeah. The left has too much power and too much success culturally right now to think that any incremental moves on our part are gonna bring them back to the table or gonna somehow mm -hmm. reconstruct the social fabric. It's just not going to happen. What we have to do is create actual market incentives. You have to create an actual consequence for their behavior. And so I think that it is only by ripping things apart economically. They've ripped everything apart culturally and paid no economic consequence. We have to rip things apart economically, create an actual dollars and cents consequence for what they've already done culturally so that they will have to actually compete once again for our business. Right now, all these corporations, Harry's Razor is a great example. I mean, they believe that they can say the most vile and offensive things about conservatives and conservatives will still shop with them because conservatives still need a good razor, right? That, in that way, by taking over all of the basically corporations, essentially all at the same time, in a period of time between 2012 uh, and 2020, we saw a complete change in almost every corporation in the country. Uh, by taking that much territory that fast, no alternatives were able to form, and therefore there was no consequence. People, you know, conservatives like to talk about boycotts, but it's nonsense. You still need goods and services. Yeah. You're going to ultimately get those goods and services from the only people producing them. And right now, most of the companies producing them you know, are, are hostile to conservative values. So I think by creating those consequences, do we make things worse? I don't know. We, we certainly... In the interim, maybe. maybe. We certainly uh, exacerbate. We, at a minimum, we bring into the light how bad things actually are. Yeah. But perhaps by doing so and creating those economic incentives, we can change those underlying behaviors by corporate America and get one of the institutions back. Corporate America is one of the most important, uh, historically, one of the most important bulwarks against state power because it's a, you know, the individual always has a collective action problem. Yeah. 
the, the intervening institutions that Vivek Ramaswamy likes to talk about are such an important part of how we defend against uh, state intrusion and we and the corporations are one of the most you know, the states obviously but yeah. the progressives eroded that at the beginning of the 20th century uh, the church but the progressives have been eroding that since 2012 in particular corporations very important but again they've been being uh, infiltrated especially since about 2012 so uh, i think in all of those areas we sort of have to start with the ones that we most recently lost uh, and go to it's harder to start your own states but you can definitely That's start true. your own razor company. teal tried it didn't yeah, it didn't yeah. work out um yeah. all right so unless someone think you're completely immune to any sort of you know compromise or whatever I, i'm always curious um mm -hmm. when i talk to conservatives too is there a is there someone on the left or a democrat that just comes to mind that you're just you know i i really i appreciate this individual or i i respect even if i disagree cordially mm -hmm. I, I i love their heart for america or or just or even a policy potentially that like you know haven't worked out thoroughly but like i don't think this is the worst idea in the world no i think the left uh is deeply antithetical uh, and, and it's filled with deep antith antipathy to america at the moment there are plenty of democrats for whom i have great respect uh for, who i think love the country who i think have good intentions even when i disagree with them on policy you know kristen cinema is a great example Tuls tulsi gabbard is a great example bill maher is a great example yeah. mansion is a great example you know these are these are guys with whom i disagree at a policy level on most everything, and I bet our voting records have never really aligned. Have never really aligned, but I at least have respect for them and think that we share, uh, broadly speaking, um, common sort of hope for the country or common hope for our fellow citizens. The left, which is the language you use, is a very particular thing. Right. You know, the the left is deeply illiberal. The left is deeply hostile to the individual. The left is deeply hostile to God. The left is deeply hostile to the country. Uh, you know, so I, I have nothing in common with Ilhan Omar. I have nothing in common with Bernie Sanders. We don't share any of the same goals. We don't share any of the same underlying values to speak of. Um, you know, probably likes his dog. You know, I like my dog. So probably doesn't want to see people murdered in the street. To start with, yeah. I don't want to see people murdered in the street. But <laughs> Democrats, yes, there are many Democrats who, who I admire. There are many dis Democrats with whom I enjoy disagreeing. And I am not a, I, I'm not like a flaming right winger. Well, flaming a, is probably not the uh, most apt. That, yeah, probably every use of flaming was in, in, uh, in poor taste there. Every possible connotation. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not an extreme conservative of the stripe that is in vogue right now. Yeah. I'm, I am a liberal in the traditional sense. I believe in maximizing individual freedom. Uh, I'm a I very much support the founding of the country. I support the declaration. I believe all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. It's the most important sentence written since, uh, since the apostle Paul. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative in the, in the sort of Reagan yeah. tea party sense of the, sense of the term. Not so much in like, I mean, I think some of his ideas are very good, but broadly speaking, I'm not like a Yoram Pizzoni nationalist. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a first things Catholic integralist type conservative. Uh, again, we probably have mostly voted the same. All those guys voted for uh, Bush who, who were old enough and the ones who are too young. It's just a cop out for them to say they wouldn't have. Of course they would have. Yeah. Uh, and so they're my political allies, but... You know, we don't see eye to eye on every, on every philosophical argument. Bill Maher is, is uh, not my political ally. And yet in this moment, to the extent that he wants to stand against wokeism, to the ex extent that he wants to stand for freedom of speech and for uh, the country, he is a kind of ally right now. And I have a lot of admiration for him. Oh, I've always appreciated. He, he will, and he takes a lot of flack, too, for you know, criticizing his own side and also bringing up people he vehemently disagrees with. Yeah. Um, and I've always, because that's, at the heart of it, that's like my deepest desires. I just don't know where we lost the ability and at what point, that's probably another interview, but just to, uh, to oh. be able to have a conversation. No, I can speak to that. Okay. As the left has become more and more illiberal, the, I think one of the great mistakes of the sort of Catholic integralist uh, philosophical movement going on in the country right now, the the quote unquote common good conservatives or, I mean, all these, all these labels are loose 
fitting at best. And so mm -hmm. I can kind of point in the direction of something, but I don't want to get too specific about it because I don't think any of us are using the terms as, uh, as absolutely as, as we probably should. Uh, their argument is that liberalism wrought the left. That essentially from the second that Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, that line in the declaration, there was always going to be inevitably, you have to have drag queen story hour at the end of that. Of course, I don't believe that that's true. I think you can't just skip 250 years of actual things that actually happened mm -hmm. that could have happened differently. Now, it's fair to say there are no hypotheticals. We only have the world that we have. But that you might as well then say, from the minute that my grandfather closed the back door, we were always going to have drag queen story hour. I mean, that may be true in some sort of absolutist sense, but it's ludicrous from a philosophical point of view. What I would say is that this sort of illiberalism that we're experiencing on the right today in America and around the world, but American, the American right has always been unique. It's always been a more liberal right than, say, the European right. The illiberalism that we feel on the right today is it declares itself to be a reaction to the, 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 sort of, um, the sort of rotten fruits of liberalism. But it's actually and demonstrably not. It is actually and demonstrably a reaction to the illiberalism of the Obama left. That Obama, in particular after 2012, uh, became a voice for racial division. He became a voice uh, in, in the, in the ugliest political calculation probably ever made by an American president, certainly in the modern era. Uh, Obama, whose ascendancy, while I opposed it politically, was nevertheless like the crowning moment of uh, America's long battle against racism and, and, and its long battle to actually live up to its cr fundamental creed. Uh, a majority white nation ascended a black man to be president. It's an amazing moment. Again, I, I didn't vote for him. I opposed him politically, but I can recognize what that meant. What, that was a statement by the country that whatever our history, we, we are not fundamentally a racist country. And you know, we elected the man who said there isn't a white American, a black America, the United States of America. Four years later, he needed to get reelected. Obamacare was a shambles. Uh, uh, he had failed to deliver on many of his uh, promises. Romney was a strong candidate whom, who I did not support you know, in, the, uh, in the primaries and, and was very skeptical of in the general. Nevertheless, he was, he was polling very well. And Obama made a very ugly political calculation to reignite racial division in the country so that he could put uh, a traditional Democrat winning coalition together. Uh, and we live in the most racist country today that I've ever lived in. Not the most racist country that's ever existed. I mean, there were slaves, there was Jim Crow, but I didn't live through any of that. I was born in 1979. I was born in a country where Bill Cosby's the most famous man on TV and Michael Jackson is the most famous person on the radio and Morgan Freeman is the, the first, is president in the movies and Michael Jordan is probably the most famous American. You know, that's the country I grew up. I, I grew up in a country where you could go to Barnes and Nobles and buy a joke book and you could flip over to the black jokes section and you could flip over to the wasp joke section yeah. and you could flip over to the Polish jokes section because we're we're all over those historic problems not to say that there were no racists left in the country there were no vestigial uh, lingering problems from uh, Jim Crow or or slavery of course that's just reality but on a sort of fundamental level we were on the path to electing Barack Obama now we live in a country that's deeply racially divided because of that ugly political. So things were getting better. Things were getting. And then basically took a dive. It's because obviously, yeah, no one would. That's right. That, you know, one of the things that's been, I, I, I mean, it's been a really rough, obviously, two years. But like, <laughs> I appreciated the conversations that I guess one of the upsides is the conversations that started happening with like, going to say, hey, look, you don't know my experience um, and what I've been. And it was, and it was interesting mm. to have that discourse. But um, you're right. It's it, it's hard to remember because you know it just wasn't talked about, and now it's and then but yeah. So it seems like things suddenly right. started so this, going downhill. This move right now in conservatism, which says, which is is kind of happening, I think, to create a philosophical or, or retcon to explain Trump's ascension in 2016. Um, I think we we've sort of retconned this philosophy now that says liberalism always was going to lead to the worst things, and that's why we have to be less liberal now on the right. But I actually think it's the emerging illiberalism of the Obama left that led. It's not 
drag queen story hour, although I certainly oppose drag queen story hour. The fundamental problem, though, isn't, um, isn't the idea that there are people who disagree with us. It's the government suddenly saying, you are not allowed to say anything about it. You're not allowed to oppose it. You're not allowed to have an opinion about it. Uh, if you do, all of the cultural instruments, all, all those institutions we discussed will align against you. The government itself will align against you. When the government started telling us that we had to agree, had to agree with the left, when the media started telling us that we had to agree with the left, when entertainment started telling us we had to agree with the left, not, not those institutions leaned left. They became the enforcement arms of a broadly leftist philosophy, an illiberal leftist philosophy. Then the right, which is throughout all of history, the right is a reactionary movement. The reaction to the illiberalism of the left is this sort of emerging illiberalism that we're experiencing, uh, that we're experiencing on the right. Now, we might try to couch that in like the ideas of Edmund Burke or uh, you know some of the, some of these sort of classically conservative views, which which never fully embraced the American experiment. Although I think that's probably not a fair characterization of Burke. Although it is the way that a lot of modern conservatives like to think about Burke, it's not really a fair characterization. Nevertheless, I think that what we're really fighting against is uh, when when one part of the country is told that it can't believe what it believes, and that will be enforced maximally, then that same side is going to want to have that same amount of power yeah. to go and force its views back the other way. That, that's, that's kind of the ugliness of this moment. And you can't, you can't uh, begrudge people feeling that way when they're being uh, put upon in the way they are by all the institutions. I don't fully agree with it. I, I think I understand it and am sympathetic toward it. Um, but, but I think that ultimately, you know, what, what probably unites guys like Bill Maher, Joe Rogan, and you know, people like me on the, on the other side of many policy considerations is just the understanding that this illib that illiberalism breeding illiberalism is not, is not a sustainable path for the country. It's only going to lead to something bad one way or the other. Are you hopeful about the future of the country from where we sit now? Yeah, well... I'm not a soothsayer. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm an optimist uh, in that I think God commanded us to have optimism. He said, be fruitful and multiply. That's a fundamentally optimistic act. You have to believe in the future to bring children into the world. He says all throughout Genesis, lift up now thine eyes. You know, stop, stop looking down and look up. Leave the land of your fathers and go into the land that I've uh, given you. That's a fundam fundamental call to optimism. It's a call to creativity. It's a call to creation and a call to uh, to, to productivity. I'm also a realist about what human beings are. Human beings do horrible things to each other. They have all throughout mm -hmm. history. You know, it, it wasn't worse than the long time ago we days. Like the 20th century is the bloodiest century yeah. on record. You know, we're not far enough into the 21st century to say whether or not we'll do much better. Everybody who's rich sucks and everybody who's poor sucks and everybody who's rich is unhappy and everybody who's poor is unhappy. Like, the problem of humans is the problem of humans is the problem of humans. Empires rise and empires fall. What will happen to America? I don't know. Um, but you can either live your life under the burden of what humans are and all the horrible things that they can and do uh, to each other, or you can lift up now thine eyes. You can leave the land of your fathers and go into the land of promise. You can be fruitful and multiply. I choose to embrace that creativity and say, I don't know what's going to happen to the country, I'm going to do my level best to effectuate a positive outcome, knowing that ultimately the success or failure of, of every human uh, enterprise is in the hands of God, not in the hands of, mm. you know, a lowercase GK. That's probably, that's probably beyond uh, even my exalted purview. Hey man, we got a little Pastor Jeremy there. I was, I wish we kind of had. A, I was looking for a call and answer there. I was like, I need an amen for that. As we, uh, hey man, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank no, you. It's like, you know, thank you. Just call, calm the crowd down there. We can do a bad, a bad studio track in there. Um, so I actually, I'd love to go back to just a little bit here before we land our yeah. plane uh, to the founding because uh, your history is in screen. I love that you're, you're screenwriter and we're film for so on production company, et cetera, and then. Go back to the founding of Daily Wire. Was it is the mission the same as it was then as it is now? Um, has it evolved? Uh, I'm curious. Like when you first got into this, and I'm yeah. speaking to entrepreneur uh, Jeremy, divine Jeremy, past Jeremy, you know, can speak as they will. But um, entrepreneur-wise, was this the mission when you started off? Yes, but 
we, we had delusions from day one. I mean, you're, it's not a, a coincidence that the, that the conservative media company, which is putting out feature films as we speak, the conservative media company that just committed $100 million to putting out kids entertainment, not educational, but entertainment content. Uh, it's not a, a, a coincidence that that company was founded by the guy who ran Friends of Abe and the guy who had production right. companies in Hollywood for two decades. Um, always a part of my vision for what should be happening in our movement is that we needed to stop criticizing culture and start creating culture. You know, I, I, it's not a coincidence that this company was founded by two m men mentored by Andrew Breitbart, Ben Shapiro, and myself. You know, the man who, who popularized the idea that politics is downstream of the culture. Uh, all, of, all of that is the foundation of our thinking. If you had asked me in 2016 or 2017 or 2018, when are you going to make a movie? People did ask me that all the time. And I would say, when we can. And I lost uh, even some, some very good friends. I, w I won't name them, but people who work in the company and worked for the company at that time, who believed in sort of that founding vision, who lost sort of hope in 2017, 2018, 2019, that we would ever actually do it. And they, I, I think that I kind of got a vote of no confidence from all of them during that period of time, from many of them during that time, because I was so focused on the business success, you know, the financial success of the company, and they felt like I had in some ways betrayed mm. the sort of cultural vision. Um, These are people that were with you from the beginning? Yeah. So and is that, is that, I mean, that's, as a CEO and a founder, is that like a brutal part of building a, a company? Was that? I would say that, that that time period, it sort of all came to a head in 2018, is the hardest year probably of my life um, in, every, in every way. And, th and certainly f f my friends feeling that I had betrayed our common purpose was itself a kind of betrayal for, for me. I felt the kind of betrayal out of all of that. Uh, because they're very good guys and very creative guys and were not put on earth and built to build something the way that I've built this. And so they, they were impatient for it and didn't understand what the cost of it would actually be. Hmm. And I think most of those same guys now are very excited by what we're, by what we're doing. They can see that it's kind of finally arrived. Uh, that, that moment has arrived. And probably if they were here, they would even sort of in, in retrospect be able to see that we had to go through the things that we went through to get from point A to point B. But it, was, it took much longer than I or they thought it would. It was much harder than I or they thought it would be. And, and certainly, certainly there was a moment where I think we were all a little bit lost in the weeds of, or lost in the wilderness trying to get, trying to, get to where we were going. Were you ever worried the company wouldn't make it? I mean, I'm, I'm as curious as, a, as your, your founding journey. I mean, was it, was it like, no, we're, we're going to make this? Because I know you guys went through ups and downs and like every company. You asked I, that question in the past tense. Yeah. I'm concerned every day about whether or not the company will make it. I, I walked straight here from a, uh, an orientation meeting once a month, all of our new employees uh, go through orientation and I, I try to every month go in and, and sort of give an outline of the vision of the company. And we're hiring people so fast, right? I mean, we've hired 70 people uh, or more since January 1st. It's just a rocket ship right now. And, and I told them, you know, success is certainly not guaranteed for the Daily Wire. We had an opportunity in 2019, Ben and Caleb and I, where we could have started distributing huge sums of money to ourselves and uh, you know, gotten boats or whatever we were gonna do. And we made a decision at that point that there was more that we wanted to accomplish. We needed to push all of our chips back in. Uh, and so we invested all of that money. We continue to invest all, you don't hire 70 people uh, and get the boat. You, you give up the boat and go hire the 70 people. Or you get a very big boat if it's 70 people. Yeah, we're, we're gonna need, we're gonna need a, a few more boat. years. We're gonna need a bigger boat. So all, all of that to say, the speech that I just gave moments before this started was, we are on a rocket ship. We have already left the launch pad. We are trying to get to Mars. Uh, it is not guaranteed that we will even get to orbit. We, we have to maximize our wins 
and minimize our losses every single day in the hopes that the winds will carry us, that there's enough thrust to get us to orbit. Because if we don't get to orbit, we crash back into the Earth. Those are your only two options. You either, you either break away or you hit the ground. There's no leveling off and flying forever. That's not what happens in any human enterprise. You grow or you die. And I think that the next 36 months are critical for this company. It, it will be determined in that period of time uh, whether or not we have enough, uh, whether or not we have enough thrust to, uh, to slip the surly bonds and get where we're going, uh, or if those will just be poetic words spoken over our grave. Uh, I, I don't know which it'll be. I know that, again, I'm an optimist. I'm fighting as hard as I can for the things that I believe. I'm fighting as hard as I can for this company. Um, my team is fighting as hard as they can. You know, we're, we're pushing all the chips in every day. We're taking the biggest risks, I think, of anybody in the conservative movement today. That's why when every now and then you take some friendly fire because of policy and philosophical disagreements, say from the, some, some people in the sort of Catholic integralist or common good or nationalist uh, or Trumpist or what, you know, all these factions within conservatism, you'll always take friendly fire from them because you have a subtly different view of how a particular policy should work or a subtly different view of the philosophical underpinnings of something that you actually agree about. That's the crazier, the crazier disagreements. And I always, you can't help but think, guys, what, we agree on 90% of everything yeah. and who is doing more to advance our shared interests than the Daily Wire right now today? I'll put a, I will put our record of success today in this moment up against any single anybody out there, uh, and you're damn right we're going to make it, or, or we won't. <laughs> no, that's, and I'm just, real quick too, when you, when you first started this, um, and the original, and you're like ta brainstorming, I'm trying to picture if there's a local coffee shop or something that you and Ben are sitting at when you want to found this, like is this, so this was the vision that you're like, we're going to make movie, like we're going to, it's going to start this way, yes. we're going to start with, you know, the Daily Wire, and then but ultimately this is the long-term vision, we're going to be making we're going to have a studio. We're going to make movies and My TV. first meeting with Ben that I ever had, we were introduced by phone by Mark Masters, uh, a, a wonderful man who had a company at that time called Talk Radio Network, which was, I think at that time was the largest private uh, talk radio syndicator in the country. He had Michael Savage and Laura Ingram. And Ben worked for Mark, and Mark wanted to get in the movies. So the very first meeting I ever had with Ben Shapiro was uh, at the Coffee Bean in Studio City on Ventura Boulevard. Um, which, you know, is where you have to meet Ben because he keeps kosher, so you can only meet him at a certain number of places. Uh, and the conversation had nothing really to do with politics. It was about how to bring conservative values into, into film and television uh, as an actual business function, you know, at that, point, at that time a function of the TRN business. So, yes, this has always been foundational to our relationship, foundational to our vision uh, for what we wanted to build together. Um, and it just took a long time to get to a position where we had the resources uh, to be able to tackle it. Final two questions for you. Um, do you, what would you say to yourself 10 years, I mean, in, indiscriminate amount of time, but just, I love asking folks, what yep. would you say to a, a younger Jeremy and plead with him, like, hear, hear me out on this? Yeah. I can be, it can be more than one thing if there's replete sure. wisdom stored in there. Well, the, the first thing, and I've said this before publicly, but Dreams are very good for getting you out of bed in the morning, but you can be a slave to your dreams. And one of, I think, the hard lessons that young Jeremy had to learn is to let his dreams die so that he could have the dream, like the actual dream. Um, you, you, can't, you can't live a life with no dreams. You'd probably have no motivation to ever start anything, but you also have to come face to face with reality. Ben helped me with this when I first met him. I'd never, I'd never made 15,000 dollars in any year in my life when I met Ben Shapiro. I ran Friends of Abe all those years for free. Uh, there were years where I... A true nonprofit. <laughs> yeah. There were years where I had uh, a production company. I paid a couple hundred thousand dollars out to other people. I paid myself fifteen thousand dollars. I had a bad idea about money and I thought that it would be immoral for me to take money before a venture had finally succeeded. But in doing that, thing that I thought was good, not being wasteful of an investor's money, or a donor's money. Uh, I was removing 
the relationship between my success and the success of the venture. I, I, was, I was breaking that fundamental incentive that needed to exist. And Ben, ben helped me see that. And one of the things he said is, you, he said, you know, you, you have a lot of good ideas. You work hard. You're always fighting against reality. Uh, he says, you know, your, your problem isn't that you need to stop pissing, but it's you need to stop pissing into the wind. Like, turn around and see how far it goes. Yeah. And, and it changed my life. That, that advice changed my life. It was sort of reinforced by another friend of mine, Frank, uh, who I won't say his last name because he's not a public figure, but who, who during that same period of time was kind of giving me a similar, uh, a similar perspective. And between the two of them, they helped me see that you know, I, needed to, I needed to actually practice what I preached. I, I preached market incentives. I preached capitalism, but I sheltered myself from it. And mm. in a way, I was hiding from responsibility. So yeah, it's not, I would tell younger Jeremy, it's, you know, it's good to make money. It's good to have responsibilities. It's good to let your dream die so that you can have the dream. Uh, it's good to accept reality. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't fight to change reality, um, but you can't wish reality away. And I think that the other, the other advice that I would give him is just that, you know, life is in the living, not in the goals. One thing I'm getting to experience now, I finally have great success, could be temporary. Uh, I have great wealth, could be temporary. I have a great family. Uh, you don't know what's gonna come, you know, what's gonna come of that. People face many, many unthinkable hardships. Um, because of all, this, all of the struggling I did in my youth, I'm able to hang somewhat, uh, uh, to wear all these things somewhat loosely. You know, I, I don't, I'm not overly consumed with the success or overly consumed with the money or overly consumed with the stability. Uh, and because of that, even though I'm working the hardest I've ever worked, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm the freest. I've, I have the most responsibility and burden that I've ever had and also the most freedom. Hmm. So I would, have, I would have liked to have shaken young Jeremy and told him that. But, you know, I'm sure many people tried. I'd probably have about as much success talking to that young knucklehead as as they all did. We have a flamethrower now, so you probably could persuade him more. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, under threat. Well, since there's a, a statistically very likely chance this may be the last episode of my show I ever get to do um, <laughs> after a conversation with you. So yeah. one of my favorite questions I always ask everyone, uh, and I'd love to finish off with, um, is, uh, do you, so we camping, you know, we're supposed to be at camp, but this is about as close to a campfire. Campfire, as we're yeah, we could have roasted um, some s'mores. I'm a huge Rod Serling fan. Um, love, love the Twilight Zone, yeah. absolutely amazing. I've asked some of you this, and everyone, or most people have a really, somewhere in their world, they have a, a, a weird story or something bizarre that happened to them, or scary or spooky. Mm -hmm. Do you have something that happened to you? I know being a conservative in Hollywood is probably the most terrifying <laughs> thing you've endured, but uh, beyond that, is there something that's a little mysterious or Twilight is only that's ever happened to you? Yeah, I feel terrible about this question because I can't answer it. I have one of the great ghost stories of all oh, time. Oh, don't tease us, but you can't. And I don't, I, I have, I've made, I've made a specialty in life of not telling it. Uh, someone asked me today, one of the very few, uh, and when I say very few, certainly fewer than 15 people who, who I've ever told the story to, uh, and I, I had lunch with one of them today, and, and observed how important this story is in my life, how foundational, how formative, and, and how I can't tell it to anyone because it's so inexplicable, and I know what it sounds like when I do tell it. What I will say is many people ask me about my bent key. And I've worn this key around my neck every single day, uh, uninterrupted with, with only two small and deliberate exceptions since, uh, since I was 16 years old. It doesn't always smell great, uh, but I've worn the key all this time because the key was bent under what could be described as supernatural uh, what could be described as a supernatural experience. And the, the experience, which was not a single moment, but a period, a period of time that went on for many, many, many months and was filled with very frightening and, inex and somewhat inexplicable uh, events, was formative for me in my understanding of God, formative for me in my understanding of myself, Formative for me in my understanding of what I suppose one would describe as my calling uh, in life, and it was also scary as hell. And so, one day with more <laughs> bourbon, 
uh, you might become person number 16, but not while the cameras are rolling. Well, to get that story, you're just going to have to click that subscribe button. Right? Oh, that was good. See? Tie it in there. So yeah, I like it. Well, you know, I'm pretty much out of, there's a lot, you know, you mentioned earlier, there's a, um, you've been uh, built for remarkable moments uh, and your psyche is able to be numb to them. I know you would count this interview as one of them. <laughs> Um, I, I've certainly felt numb the whole right, time I was right. here. Um, but uh, is there anything else that you want to mention um, to the dozens of people who yeah. will inevitably see this? You know, we, we've talked a little bit about my, my background and, and the things that brought me to be what I am, about the state of the country, left and right, about the state of the movement on the right. Uh, and it, it can sound like there's nothing but conflict uh, and things to lament and grieve all around. M maybe you hear my description of sort of the philosophical struggle on the right and you agree with me and you feel bad, uh, maybe you hear it and you really disagree with me, you, you know, you're a, uh, on, on a different side of some of those philosophical conversations you, and you're just angry that I have all this success. I, I, understand, all, I understand all of that, but if I were going to leave anyone with anything, it's that you know, the world is, life is for living and we're not called to lives of grief and lamentation. Uh, we're, we're called to lives of faith and we're privileged to be born into this moment. We're privileged to have the struggles around us that we have. Uh, we're privileged to be able to, to battle the way that we're able to battle. Uh, and so I would just call people to that same sort of spirit of optimism that we've been discussing and say, you know, get out there, defend your ideas, defend your values, defend your country, defend your beliefs. Yes. Don't forget to enjoy life. Don't forget to love your kids. Have kids and love them. Get married and love your wife. Or get married and love your husband. Uh, life is a wonderful gift, and, and we're not here for all that long, and our mm -hmm. lives have to be about more than just politics. It's very easy to use like the language of warfare and politics. Uh, you'll know when we're at war with the left. Um, we're not at war with the left now. We're, we're in a deeply important and perhaps even existential struggle uh, with the left. That's certainly true. Uh, but but no, no bullets are flying. Your house isn't burning. I'm in California. This, well, your bad. house might burn. Yeah. This, is a time, this is a time to live and enjoy life, to bring your best to everything that you do, and, and to be uh, energized by the struggle, not defeated by it. Hmm. Well, thank you. You know, I've, I've read Xerxes, Caesar, Alexander the Great, other uh, deified uh, monarchs in history, and I must say, you're the most approachable and the one I Aww. seem to uh, have the most in common with. So anyways, well, Jeremy, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. And campers, I hope you'll check out uh, many more of their wonderful content you'll see. I know you have some big projects coming out soon, so. As a matter of fact, Terror on the Prairie, coming on June 29th, starring Gina Carano. We couldn't be more excited about it. Well, check it out, campers. Thanks for joining us, folks. If you want to help us out, and we're confident you do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button here on our YouTube channel. And if you ever feel like just listening to these, you can check us out on all major podcast streaming